Hello everyone, it's History Behind the Warrior, and welcome back to another Mortal Kombat video. Today, of course, in celebration of that fantastic reveal trailer for the Master of Souls, Ermac. Now, Ermac is a longtime fan beloved favorite, one with a very illustrious history throughout the franchise, as he has just as much of an interesting story about his creation as he is a character. Something we will, of course, be talking about in today's video. So we will be exploring his origin, creation, as well as tackle how he has evolved from timeline to timeline. But before we do begin, if you're enjoying these sort of big lore dumps on the channel and wish to see more things Mortal Kombat related, please do give this video a thumbs up as it really helps it in the algorithm. Especially seeing as that reaction video unfortunately got age restricted. So it would really go a long way here. And if you want to stick around to see more, please do, of course, feel free to subscribe. Anywho, let's jump right into things. Now, for us to talk about Ermac, it's actually pivotal to understand how he came to be. Because Ermac wasn't some kind of drawing on the board or something hidden. It's actually much deeper than that. And for us to talk about it, we must dial the clock all the way back to 1992 with the very first Mortal Kombat cabinet. During the arcade era, Rumors were notorious and rampant with in-game unlockables and who you could and couldn't fight in-game. One of those said rumors was the supposed secret red ninja, Ermac, and was said to be the game's other secret ninja alongside Reptile. But in actuality, this was all merely a ruse. Ermac wasn't a secret, nor was he in fact an actual character at the time. Ermac was merely a rumor constructed by fans that kind of became arcade legend. In a very detailed tweet by Ed Boon, I will have it linked in the description below, it is revealed that the name Ermac was simply an acronym in the game's audits for the term Era Macro. It was simply a bit of coding designed to serve as a counter of sorts for how many times Reptile had been fought. So, once fans saw the phrase Ermac, Many believe this to be yet another hidden fighter within the game's files. And of course, with no internet at the time, this rumor ran wild, with many claiming to have fought and defeated him. A lie at this point in time, but one that did lay down the foundation for what was coming in future installments. As the rumor of Ermac would continue to run rampant during the lifespan of Mortal Kombat 2. Thus, by the time of Mortal Kombat 3, Ed Boon and John Tobias finally decided to pull the trigger on the Ermac rumor, finally giving the character life as the Crimson Red Ninja of Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. And Ermac was received with much fanfare and love, held up in extremely high esteem. So the history and creation of Ermac is really just as interesting as his own lore in the canon. With that said, let's officially talk about the history of Ermac and how he was ushered into the series. Now, as mentioned, Ermac made his official game debut in Ultimate MK3, but he was created prior to this at an undisclosed time, being forged by the dark hand of Shao Kahn as he conjured the souls of the damned into one sentient living life. Ermac is a physical vessel for thousands of souls, one assimilated into that of the perfect being, the perfect weapon for the Emperor. Now, there was, of course, purpose behind Ermac's creation, as during this period, Shao Kahn had a long-running feud with Earthrealm, as he seek to conquer it through the Mortal Kombat tournament. But with blockade after blockade put in his way, his frustration and bitterness had Ermac prepare for a mass invasion. But before we enter said skirmish, he would at one point be dispatched to that of the Neverrealm. Whilst a clear time is never actually given, as his inclusion is part of Deception's conquest mode, Ermac would be appointed the mission of tracking down and slaying the demon Ashra, someone who at the time had been killing many of the Khan's allies. Unfortunately for Ermac, once entering the realm, he had not counted on its malcontent nature, one that was known for draining the magic of any wielder. And with his entire being composed of souls, it had rendered him incredibly weak. 
and may have possibly killed him if it wasn't for the assistance of Shijinko, an outworlder who granted him the Soul Stone, restoring him back to his full strength. So as a thank you to the young man, he would teach him in his ways of combat before then continuing his pursuit of Ashura. It's never actually revealed if the two did butt heads, but both continue to exist in that of later installments. Following his trip to the Neverrealm, Ermac would be dispatched to that of Earthrealm, taking part in the Khan Siege. Assigned with the termination of mortals, the Master of Souls would battle against Earthrealm's defenses in the hopes of granting Shao his victory. Yet all of these efforts would be in vain, as Shao was defeated by Liu Kang. His weakened state sent him back to Outworld, with many defecting from his side, and even Edenia peeling away from his grasp. In the aftermath, Shao was able to maintain his connection with Ermac's collective, but his weakened form definitely put a strain on them, something that would be severed in Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. Whilst not a playable character in this game, it is mentioned in his Deception bio how he encountered Ken Shi. Having sensed the strained tether between Ermac and the Emperor, Ken Shi would use his telekinesis to free his mind, allowing Ermac for the first time in his own existence to have his own free will. And with a new lease on life, he couldn't help but be eternally grateful towards Ken Shi, even teaching him some of his ways as an eternal symbol of his gratitude. From this point onwards, Ermac would become a force of good within the realm, fighting back against those who would bring more harm than good, bringing us now all into the events of Mortal Kombat Deception. Here, Ermac is a really big player, being quite pivotal in the battle against Onaga, because in the fall of Deadly Alliance, many of Earthrealm's heroes had been slain by the united forces of Shang Tsung and Quan Chi, using the souls of the living as fuel for the mummified army of Onaga. What they hadn't anticipated was that this was all part of a much larger ploy, that the Dragon King himself had been plotting his return, and the Deadly Alliance had unknowingly served him back his army, giving him elite foot soldiers in the form of the resurrected Earthrealm heroes. With the stakes as high as ever, Omak would be approached by the fallen spirits of Liu Kang and inform him of Onaga's pursuit for the Kami Dogus. Knowing that this would spell the end for the realm, Omak would band with Liu Kang, Nightwolf, and Shijenko to stop his ascension to divinity. And it's the vast collective of Omak that allows him to fight off the revived heroes, giving Liu the time he needs to break them from his influence and allowing Shijenko to defeat Onaga as Nightwolf is able to seal him away. They had won, the battle was over, but the war had just begun. Coming into Mortal Kombat Armageddon, the end was nigh for this timeline, as the Pyramid of Argus had arisen, a symbol and omen of the end days. Atop this pyramid sat the Fire Primordial Blaze, a being who would grant whoever defeated him divinity that surpassed the Elder Gods. Armies would rise on both sides, and blood would be shed, with Ermac joining the forces of light in what would be their final battle. He would be one of the many to fall during that day, as it was Shao Kahn who rose to victory. So this brings us up to our first reboot of the canon, Mortal Kombat 9. And this game effectively serves as both a sequel and a reboot of the franchise, maintaining the continuity, but setting us back to the events of the first tournament. In this universe, Omak is one of the last combatants to feature in the tournament, being Shao Kahn's big gun to take on the White Lotus champion, Liu Kang. So for the most part, the origins of Omak do remain the same here as he's a large collection of souls, obedient to that of the Khan. Yet, even with all of that vast power and control, he is unable to defeat Liu Kang, in turn, allowing him to go on and win the first tournament. Omak is then later seen during the MK2 section, slumbering and rejuvenating until he is disturbed by the audience of Sub-Zero, Jax, and Sonya. 
Having immediately recognized the threat he presented, Jax looks to take him down, only to be stopped in place. Now restored to full strength, this is very easy pickings for Ermac, using his telekinesis to completely destroy Jax's arm. Omak's gaze slowly turns towards Kwai Liang, looking to finish him as well. He does, however, extremely underestimate the Cryomancer, and is defeated by him very early on. Because of this, Omak can be seen later during the tournament, batting the likes of Johnny Cage, and even breaking his knee. Unfortunately, we don't see him fight anyone else during the tournament, as it does end rather abruptly with Shao Kahn's defeat and apparent death. So coming into the MK3 section, Shao has returned, and much like the original timeline, Omak would be dispatched to crumble Earthrealm's defenses, killing as many humans as physically possible, battling the likes of Striker and a Cyberized Sub-Zero. This, however, would still not be enough to turn the tide to Shao's favor, as he's later defeated by Raiden in the game's climax. Prior to the events of Mortal Kombat X, during the 20 or so year time skip, we do come to learn Ermac would align himself with Melina, as she was seen and believed to be Shao's true successor, the one to inherit his title and usher in a new age. Sadly though, it's one reigned with tyranny, as Melina's title of Khan did not mean she was a worthy successor. Her regime and time under the mantle crippled its people, and did far more harm than it ever did good. So once Omak learns of Melina's true creation, born within Shang Tsung's flesh pits, he did not see her as a true successor to Shao, turning on the Karnum during a confrontation with Kotal. Here, she is defeated and is then captured. So from this point onwards, Omak would be extremely loyal to that of Kotal, sticking by his side and fighting back against any of Melina's assassination attempts. Omak can be seen quite later on, where the former Empress has been killed, and it is revealed that Devora has secretly been working with Quan Chi, plotting for Shinnok's return as they meticulously plan to steal his amulet from under Kotal's care. It is actually Ermac and his allies who do discover this revelation. Before they're able to take this information to Kotal, they would be ambushed by Cassie and her team, who have just escaped imprisonment. Ermac would cross paths with a Takahashi once again, but this time it is Takeda. Despite being caught off guard, Kenshi's kin is able to defeat him and walk away victorious. Now, Ermac makes his last canonical appearance in this timeline, during Jackie's chapter, where Shinnok has returned and Earthrealm is plunged into darkness. Seeking to bargain a deal with the fallen Elder God, Kotal has resorted to hunting down the special forces, believing that by doing so, he could buy more time for Outworld. So Omak is sent out to take their heads, having him cross paths with Jax's daughter, Jackie Briggs. Holding a deep form of resentment towards him, a fight immediately breaks out, with Jackie narrowly being able to avenge her father. Even so, this win doesn't put them at the advantage. Quite the opposite, as the overwhelming numbers catch up to them. It's only until the Lin Kuei appear, to where Ermac and his fellow Outworlders are pushed back to their home. Unfortunately, this does mock the end of Ermac in the rebooted timeline, as we do not see or know what becomes of him following X, or why he's entirely absent during MK11. With that said, he does make a cameo in 11, albeit as a crypt accessory, and we don't talk about that. This though would not spell his end, as Omak would return in the new era, albeit in a very different way, with the timeline effectively reset by Fire God Liu Kang, and Shao no longer in control of Outworld. Ermac would be forged by the like of Quan Chi, seeking to create the ultimate weapon. He would utilize a soul harvester and have it harness the dead souls of the living forest into one singular being. That, of course, being Ermac. Now here, Omak is actually a host to a number of many different souls. Ones from Shao's ancestry, ones from Baraka's lineage, but probably the most important and significant among them, King Jared, former Emperor of Outworld, 
and husband of Empress Sindel. Upon his creation, Omak immediately gets on the way, dispatching the likes of Ashra, Kenshi, Reptile, Baraka, and Johnny. We really do get to see just how formidable this iteration of the character is. It is only until he battles Kenshi, and Sento is plunged into his chest, where he takes some real significant damage. As the mystical nature of the blade disrupts and fractures Omak's very being. So once he's confronted by Ashra and Kenshi again, Omak is finally defeated. And it's here where we get to see a very brief glimpse of King Jared fighting beneath the surface. Following his defeat, Omak is then relocated to the Ying Fortress, ambushing the likes of Bi Han and trying to stop the Lin Kuei's infiltration. He does, however, severely underestimate the Cryomancer's skill and is beaten by Bi Han. He does later make his somewhat final appearance during Melina's chapter, where the united forces of Earthrealm and Outworld band together to attack the fortress. Omak goes toe to toe with Melina and Tanya, being able to dispatch of the Umgadi leader. Melina, on the other hand, proves to be far more formidable, defeating him and actually allowing Jared to gain control of the body. From this point onwards, it's effectively Jared steering it, as he reunites with his family, and together they confront Titan Shang Tsung. Unfortunately, during these events, the Empress would perish, but by being close to Ermac, in her final moments, Sindel is reunited with Jared, infused together in that of Ermac. So during the game's finale, Omak can be seen crumbling Shang Tsung's forces and preserving the new era. We do see a handful of variants during the Battle of Armageddon, but these aren't the versions we've come to be introduced to. So by the end of the story, Jared is in full control of Omak, actually assisting Outworld's new empress, Melina, as she forges an empire in this new age. So things do look to be going very well for him. But in the middle of making this video, Omak's bio actually officially released. And it does state that Omak is able to regain control of the collective. No longer bound by the royal family, nor Quan Chi, he is finally free to choose his own destiny. So with that said, this has been it for the history of Omak. And this was a really fun one to put together, as he's just a fan beloved character, and for very good reason why. From having an amazing wardrobe to having incredibly cool abilities, Omak is truly a character that stands on his own two legs, and it's honestly amazing just how much came from such a simple rumor. Omak is living, breathing proof of giving into fan demand in the best possible way. So with that said, what was your fondest memory of Ermac? Which was your favorite iteration of the character? And what would you like to see from him going forward? Please do comment down below as I'd love to hear what you have to say. And please don't forget that I will also be working on the history of Movado. So keep an eye out for that over the next few days. Especially if this is your first time being introduced to the character. Anywho everyone, as always, that's been it for me. Take care.